all, I hope you are doing well in these, I'm gonna keep using the, the U word, these unprecedented times. Welcome to the FinTech Finance Virtual Arena where uh, we're hosting you today. Uh, I am uh, Ali Patterson, editor from FinTech Finance, and I am joined today by, well, we're, we're literally all over the world at the moment. First of all, we have James. James, James, whereabouts are you at the moment? I mean, Oxford, England. Excellent, excellent. And uh, we're also joined by Kevin, and Kevin, you are? I'm in London. In London, so Oxford, London, and, and Greg, are you, are you are you nearby as well, or or somewhere else? No, I'm in Melbourne, uh, Melbourne, Australia, and happily so at this point. Excellent, excellent. That, that's what we like to hear. Well, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to have you all on our virtual arena uh, arena today. I just want to kind of get a bit of a, a background as to kind of your roles at respective organisations. Um, let we'll, we'll we'll flip this one round in reverse. Uh, Greg, what's kind of your who are you and what do you look after? So currently I'm a, a director in the engineering department in Cisco, but um, until recently I was CEO of Exablaze, which was a company that was acquired by Cisco and, uh, and we made uh, low latency uh, networking gear. Uh, I guess I came in the industry, I had a physics background, I worked in quantitative stockbroking through the 80s and uh, and then about 13, 14 years ago, I established a trading firm with some other fellows um, looking to do high frequency trading in those days, pretty much with software. And uh, uh, that business uh, started uh, trading in Korea, which was a very liquid market in those days with a, with a purely latency based strategy. And so um, aside from writing so uh, fast code and figuring out the topology of the uh, the Seoul Telecoms uh, network. Uh, we eventually started building hardware in order to ourselves, in order to start getting the, the market data off the wire more quickly and getting the orders onto the wire more quickly. And then after that, we decided to sell shovels rather than stay as miners. And so the trading side uh, diminished and the uh, the hardware side grew out of that. Uh, we were acquired by Cisco in um, in January this year. Excellent, excellent. Uh, and Kevin, uh, you're, you're yourself. Um, so currently I'm unemployable, so I'm acting as a consultant um, at, uh, to pick up on the, the, the strand that uh, Greg's developed there. Um, until a couple of years ago, Greg and I were fierce enemies because I was running the Metamico business, which got acquired by Arista. So that's where our paths crossed. Uh, I've been involved in, I'm a failed engineer by background, unlike Greg, who's a successful engineer by background. I started working in the finance sector in the mid eighties um, and have been involved both on the vendor and the bank side over that period of time. Um, but more recently I've been involved in sort of running small enterprises that serve the market. So I would say my focus is sort of building and running businesses that um, that operate in the in the finance sector from a technology perspective. Fantastic, excellent, and of course, uh, uh, James. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, so I have the pleasure of having worked for both of these gentlemen in the past. I'm currently now at Cisco, um, having been with Exablaze prior to that. So I transitioned over into Cisco as part of the acquisition, and I've got a responsibility to be the product specialist for all of those ultra low latency services that are now part of the Cisco portfolio all across the Europe, Middle East, Africa region. Um, I guess from my background and experience in this marketplace, I've, I've probably worked through the whole of the latency journey having started out building huge trading floors and open outcry stock exchange floors through to the, um, the, the big bang with the London Stock Exchange, through the MIFID regulations, each stage bringing electronic trading and the focus on latency more and more to the fore. So I've probably done the whole journey from it being people shouting at each other to where we sit now chasing the nanoseconds. Well, against that, uh, against that backdrop, there's so much kind of experience there. I mean, the uh, as, as you mentioned, James, there's that kind of traditional view of trading of again people shouting at each other across the floor. But there's that fantastic image of the trading floor at UBS in 2008 versus 2018, and it just shrinks down hu hugely. So just to kind of put it open to to the panel as a whole. What was the technology like when you first started trading uh, when it came to um, uh, ultra low latency? 
I started out building sort of thousand plus position trading floors uh, where you've got the guys with multiple screens in front of them. You've got a complex communication panel with thousands of lines and connections going out to their counterparts all over the world. Um, they were all highly stressed um, individuals, highly opinionated individuals, um, and they were just massive, massive sets of infrastructure. Um, you go through to the trading floors. The trading floors consisted of all these um, chaps in the, the coloured jackets that you see running around, shouting, waving their, their docks at each other, doing the trading over the, over the uh, floor. Um, and probably the biggest step change happened in 86 with the London Stock Exchange going private, Big Bang. And that was the advent of electronic, uh, the electronic world. And then what really um, took it forward was in 2005, 6, 7, the MIFID 1 regulations came in. And that really put competition on the table. And with competition came that whole ethos of, you know, I've got to be first. The, the expression race to zero, the, the need to be the first to hit a price to, to get a trade became the all important thing. And from there, we went through that journey from trying to make networks faster, trying to get um, co-location principles for data centers up and running, trying to get data centers closer to stock exchanges, looking everywhere in that trade execution cycle where we could start pulling out time. And obviously, right back in the beginning, we could pull out huge, great amounts of time for relatively low um, impact cost on the infrastructure. But as that journey goes on and on and on, we're looking to find sort of ever increasingly smaller amounts of latency, uh, ever increasing costs in which to achieve it. Um, so it, it, it's a it's a journey on that race to zero. Absolutely. Um, Greg, should we go to, go to yourself? Sure. Well, I think we're all about the same vintage. So we all we all started in the mid mid eighties in in the industry and in, in various guises. I was a uh, token rocket scientist for the broking firm that hired me uh, out of my physics department um, in the in the mid 80s. Um, yeah, I guess uh, as far as technology and the markets go, when, when I first started, uh, they gave me a crash course and a, an apprenticeship when I was literally down the trading floor, you know, waving my arms around and uh, well, in Australia, it's a different, but it's an open outcry system. Uh, I was there in 88 when our markets, I think after CATS, the Canadian system, I think SEATS, the Australian market, was one of the early electronic uh, equities markets. I was exposed to a, a company called ITG in its infancy, uh, and they were very early into algorithmic trading, uh, dark pools, and the measurement of quantitative aspects of implementation. Um, market impact and all those sorts of things which are taken for granted now is just necessary must-haves. Uh, so we're very early to connect computers to the markets. You know, if you look at what drove it, I think in the States, James gave a good summary of what happened in the UK. I think in the US, you know, you had initially the small order entry system was one of the first electronic trading uh, opportunities where small orders could bypass the specialists. Uh, and uh, the early HFTs, as they were really, were called SOS Bandits, as I recall, because nobody was very, uh, very keen on them. Um, you know, in the US, you had decimalization, and you know that started to take the wind out of the specialist sales. You had Reg NMS in 2005, you know, which um, really created the national market and black letter law for how orders had to be handled. Uh, if a broker took an order. And there were multiple potential venues and technology had to look around quickly hopefully and send a selling order to the best bid price uh, in any of the national markets um, that developed some uh, interconnects you know some low latency paths some of the sort of infrastructure that hft came to be built on uh, you had people then building smart order routers in order to sensibly you know route their orders uh, from inception to the right venue and then you had uh, early HFTs trying to anticipate where those flows were going to go and uh, and you know act act accordingly and so that's really what kicked it off in my mind uh, it was it was gradual and then 
Then you had the advent of, you know, um, alternative trading networks in the US. BATS is a prominent one that comes to mind in 2005. Uh, Dave Cummings was a, was a bit of an innovator there. He really started off just building a fast gateway to NASDAQ and then decided that he could internalize some of the order flow that was coming through his fast gateway and trade, trade with it before it hit the market. And, uh, and then really you had, you know, from 2005 to 2009, that's when volumes really kicked off and HFTs really started to hum. But I guess I came into the HFT business, I was in the broking business from 88 to, you know, 2005 or six, and then I got into the HFT business uh, around 2005, six, um, you know, until relatively recently. And we can talk more about what's happened you know, in more recent times later, but that, that's the sort of journey of, of how HFT kicked off uh, from my perspective. Absolutely, Kevin, well, what for, from, uh, for, from your end, how, how have you seen from the, again, traditional shouting to, 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 to where we are today, and what from your end has been some of the drivers behind it? Yeah, it, it's really quite interesting because, um, you know, I, I think I was involved in the, the mainstream world, um, and I think Greg has always followed a path, as he mentioned, ITG. And from a very early stage, there was a, a slightly different segment going on to the mainstream world. But, you know, picking up a point James said about, you know, in the UK at the time of deregulation and Big Bang and the large trading floors, that people recognise as the sort of first point that things started to go digital. But still, really, the majority of people, it was eyeballs on screens, although it was digital, right? And... I remember the most complicated thing people was trying to do at that point in time was a thing called composite pages, which was to produce a, a, sort, of, a sort of a paste up of a number of different screens together into one picture. And yep. most of the data feeds at that time were still written in ASCII code. So the composite page work, although it sounded very digital, what you're actually doing is measuring coordinates on screens and pasting information together because it didn't really matter that much because at the end of the day, it was an eyeball that was going to look at it. So the question of performance and things like that, people were only interested in the latest piece of information. So even if you lost stuff, it didn't really matter that much. And that went on for quite a period of time, you know, and I said, as Greg pointed out, there were other organizations, even in those early days, like ITG, that were beginning to figure out ways of actually being much more mathematical in their approach to thinking about trading whereas the vast majority of people and to james's point the thousand seat floor or even bigger was all about you know a shed with loads of people looking at screens and it was a different world i think the next really big point that hit me that i was actually involved in was um, when latency first in my mind became quite visible to everybody and there was this mad rush for it and I was working for an organization called Radiance at the time I'm not sure if you were there then James probably were I um, a bit of time there and I was given I was given a line of business in Radiance which everybody considered to be a basket case which was their hosting business it was like the Radiance network business was growing like topsy but the hosting business was a madhouse that wasn't making any money and so I was given that business to look after to try and figure out whether we got out of it or how we could make money out of it. And I, I wouldn't like to claim that it was me because I don't think it was. I can't remember really how the genesis of this came about. But we figured out that um, you could go around and buy a bits of rubbish data center that apps actually just so happened could would was physically located near to where the exchanges had their data rooms. And we called it proximity hosting at the time. It's now called Colo and it's a big industry. But I was buying racks in, in what was effectively cupboards in buildings and hosting trading algorithms from people. And that suddenly fired off this whole madhouse around, I want two racks in this location because I can get my trading engine close to the exchange. We then, uh, in New York, built a network called Ultra, which was the first fiber network to connect this hodgepodge of racks to each of the exchanges. Um, and then 
almost coincidentally, and I, I think it was a coincidence, um, that this came together then with the point that Greg made is you started getting all these new venues appearing. You know, probably prior to Bats, there was a number of number of ones that, that came about. Um, Chi X was one of the early ones. Anyway, these guys realized that actually, if they could co-locate their matching engines near the established exchanges, um, you could actually, you know, grab a piece of the market. And that caused an even increased feeding frenzy on these proximity sites. Um, the trouble is with that is that we were running out of power, running out of footprint. People were arbitraging on footprint by buying all the racks so that somebody else couldn't get in there. It was a madhouse. But that was really, to me, the first public realization that latency was important. And from that point onwards, from 2004, 2005 onwards, it's become a mantra as far as I'm concerned. And everybody's focused down on how do you improve that? And, you know, Greg's career, probably long before mine in the kind of layer one switching market was a good indicator of how serious people took that and have developed it. So, you know, that's kind of the observation on the journey from my perspective. That's amazing. I, I, I love that. And I love that with all, all of these examples, if you were suddenly swept back with all the innovations you have now to the mid eighties with what you know now, you would absolutely clean up so quickly. Yeah. Well, I, I was considered a lunatic by our, I, we got required by, by BT. And I remember a visit from a BT hosting guy telling me that I had to sell off all these data centers because they were crap and that they weren't going to meet modern standards of data center cooling and power. And, and I said, well, you're going to kill a market if you do that. Anyway, we managed to survive. Right? <laughs> you just reminded me, Kevin, there was, there was a parallel while the HFTs were competing for latency there was a parallel competition between venues uh, about their latency, um, you know, and it was sort of symbiotic, but, uh, you know, I mentioned VATS earlier, you know, New York Stock Exchange used to do 90% of the turnover and NASDAQ used to do 10, you know, and then very quickly, NYSE's share of its own listings went down to 25% or less probably now, and the numbers are a bit stale. A lot of that was driven by, uh, cross listings uh, in venues which had quicker turnaround times and so if you're a trader and you're looking to uh, put a trade out there and you have to wait some period of time before you know whether you've dealt or not and before you know what your risk situation really is you're, you're drawn to us to a to a venue with uh, with a quicker turnaround and so yeah. lower latency exchanges like bats and others the more modern ones that sort of skipped a generation you know, just siphoned uh, liquidity and turnover off uh, from the old yeah. venues as well and, yeah. and and created a deeper pool for the HFTs to play in at the same time. Yeah, no, it was it was the thing in my mind that, you know, I called it proximity at the time. That was the kind of the switch point when those new organisations, you know, typically less than 60 man bands at the time yeah. were building their venues and their engines in these in these locations to try and effectively establish a place in the market and it it did dynamically change that whole market very quickly um, obviously there was another wave of consolidation and some of them got bought and some of them merged but the reality is it never went back from that point onwards with that in mind are there any specific examples because it does seem that as soon as this you know the toothpaste came out the tube about high frequency trading are, are there any examples where an institution was able to, you know, make ridiculous 100 million plus sort of trades because of one millisecond advantages. So are there any kind of uh, examples there where this is kind of the, ah, ultra low latency is here? Well, there's, there's plenty of examples of people that have lost hundreds of millions because uh, <laughs> because their machinery has gone a bit fast for them. Uh, yes, there's, there's no doubt that uh, all the hype is true. Uh, and that there have been some very lucrative trades uh, around the world based on you know being faster than the average bear. Um, it's obviously you don't you don't get to hang on to hundreds of millions of dollars without a bit of competition coming along uh, fairly quickly. Um, but yeah, you know, there's no doubt speed equals money. You know when we first started 
you know, hundreds of milliseconds were fast because you were comparing yourself with human reaction times. And, you know, we probably expected that getting down to anything in microseconds was going to be super fast. Um, I can't tell you about specific trades, although, I, you know, we all have customers who these days prune their fibre cables, you know, to a minimum length to save that extra nanosecond. Um, how much a speed advantage is worth is also determined by the venue that you're trading in. So if you're trading into a venue with a very high jitter in its network, then you may be fastest, but you may get shuffled to number five in the queue as the orders find their way into the matching engine. And so beyond a certain point, you're just buying a ticket in the raffle um, rather than you know, winning the prize. And, uh, but you know, I know from personal experience when we were trading, uh, you know, and this wasn't co-location, you know, just finding a few, uh, a few extra microseconds, you know, multiplied our revenues by a factor of five overnight, you know, and they were already pretty good to start with. So, um, yes, you can be, uh, you can, uh, you can make a big difference. But of course, someone else comes along and you go from peacock to feather duster very quickly. Uh, and that's the nature of the, of the game. You don't really know where your competition is. You know, they could be breathing down your neck or they could be daylight second. Um, you know, everybody's on their toes all the time. And that's part of the reason why this industry, I think, has moved so fast because of that. And people are pushing the envelope all the time. Even if they're on top, they know they have to keep running. I think, I think it's very important observation there you know and, and and greg is a classic example of somebody who's got the, the right scientific background and outlook on life the big difference to me is organizations who invested in smart people with a scientific mindset to constantly observe and and, and refine and get insights as to what was going on versus people who just kind of joined the game, but really didn't keep control or keep insights to how they were performing. And I think this is really critical, is that that's the big gulf between the people who make a load of money and people who don't make money, is is the, the extent to which they're in control of what they're doing, rather than kind of on the roller coaster for the journey. And I think that's, that's fundamentally different. But the industry has changed so much that the smart people are the ones who win out in the end. Some of the smartest people I've met, you know, uh, and you, you'd be the same, Kevin, in, in your in travels and James, uh, you know, are some of the people that, you know, find their way into the HFT world. You know, there's lots of um, Russian PhDs wandering around. I don't have to be Russian, but there's plenty of plenty of smart people who, you know, live and breathe, you know, how they can find an edge, and they find their edges in the most remarkable most remarkable places they're a great crowd to sell to if you've got a better mousetrap uh, and we've both probably experienced this as well you know you didn't really need a brand we were sort of two men and a dog in australia in the early days of exablaze and uh, mm. but our product was technically good and uh, that's all they wanted to know you know if you could buy them uh, an edge in latency uh, they didn't care uh, you know what was in your marketing blurb in fact we didn't have one we just let people try it and if they're happy with the performance they'd they'd buy it yeah. because of the time equals money equation they are fairly price inelastic too which is a good way to start a small business um yeah. so we do found a, a good that... niche greg do you think that that's partly the reason why certain kinds of organizations have been able to thrive and the probably the more established organizations have kind of continued to struggle because they've got ways and policies and processes of doing things that prohibits them necessarily from a, adopting and adapting new stuff you know you take our example of the world that we both worked in with layer one switching you know if you went to a big big institution big sell side institution they might have a policy that says we can't do this kind of stuff because we can only buy you know Cisco kit or Juniper kit or whatever, you know, and somebody else has gone down the road and built built a Heath Robinson layer one switch and away they've gone, you know. Yeah, well, we, we both suffered from that. I mean, uh, the bureaucracies of dealing with big places compared to very large HFTs are very nimble. I mean, that's a characteristic that the successful ones all share. They're nimble, they make decisions quickly, you know, they don't die wondering, you know. Uh, if they're uncertain, they'll give something a try and just let, let the market experiment, you know, play out. 
it has become a big money game now. I think uh, you're probably a bit off the topic, but as you mentioned earlier, Kevin, there's been a lot of consolidation. And, you know, as you push down into the nanos, as James said, each additional nanosecond of saving comes at a much higher price than, you know, a few milliseconds did in the early days. And so the pay to play for certain trades, you know, not every trade's created equal, but, you know, multi-venue multi trades where you're talking about, you know, moving data from across the planet. Uh, you know, these days, the sort of technology used to do that is not cheap. You know, the network gear that Cisco and Arista sell that was formerly Exablaze and, um, and Meta is is small compared to the cost. Uh, the cost of that is small compared to the cost of the uh, telecoms infrastructure, you know, the microwave links and, and increasingly now even, you know, shortwave HF links, you know, across, across ocean. So it's a different game and I think that's led to some of the consolidation uh, in recent years. Uh, I think that was exacerbated by a pretty... Uh, low volatility patch until recent uh, until recent times as well. Yeah. Can we um, bring in? Uh, I, I want to again off the back of that. I want to bring in about uh, smart network uh, interface cards. What um, what can they do at the moment for for trading? I'll pick up on that one because that, that's obviously one of the uh, key product lines that we've now got in the Cisco ultra low latency lineup. Everything about the world in which we live in from a product development supplier point of view is to chase out those nanoseconds um, out of all of the devices and, and products that we sell into this market. So, you know, the, the network cards are a great example. You know, we're now looking to deliver sort of sub 600 nanoseconds um, wire to application to wire type performance in our cards as they come out of the box as, as they come out of the box you know and that in itself is a fairly eye-watering set of performance and then we'll give our client a set of tools um we have a set of tools we name them exosoc but it gives the, our customers the opportunity to start to take these cards and start to fine tune them in the configuration into their networks so you can take those types of um, form, performance characteristics and improve them even further if we've got clients that are, you know, very into this, um, eking out another nanosecond, another nanosecond, they've got the skill sets, they've got the people um, in house, and they want to get into our code and start to develop that even further. Perhaps put their own um, bespoke applications into the cards. We've got a range of smart NICs that have a greater facility. We call them the um, the V5P, the V9P cards. That gives our customers the opportunity not only to tune them up as they come out of the box, but it also allows them to start to make bespoke um, programs into these devices. And to help our clients do that, we've got a, de a development framework that wraps around it, we call it FDK. And so these very smart high frequency trading firms with their set of PhD guys that have come out of university, they can get into our platforms and they can really create smart bespoke environments that are specific to their business setups and give them that leading edge in terms of the, the trading performance and execution of their strategies to the market. So our whole ethos is to drive out those nanoseconds in the platforms we, we build and then to give our customers the tools to take those platforms and to further refine and enhance them. If I can actually trained him up well, Greg. Yeah, well, I was just gonna, I was gonna add to that wonderful characterization. And Kevin, you would have, you would have noticed this too at Meta. Um, our products have been built on uh, FPGAs, which is you know a form of programmable hardware. So um, I think uh, you know we all happen to be on the right technological bandwagon at the right time as well with our products. It was, it was a decision based on necessity. In our case, we didn't couldn't justify building our own ASIC at, you know, the cost of many million dollars and, you know, uh, with somewhat high risk. But, you know, we could use an FPGA and uh, write some firmware to turn it into a switch or a network interface card. Uh, and, you know, Meta were doing the same sort of thing. And, you know, we had a bit of an arms race with, with Matamico, uh, you know, where we had similar products and one would be faster and then we'd revise our firmware and we'd be faster and then they'd come out with some new firmware. And the customers really benefit from this, you know, this uh, this race to to lower and lower um, latencies. But 
Um, the other thing that FPGAs have allowed people to do, it's basically migrate more of their trading decisions from software, you know, down towards hardware and down towards the network. So to avoid our network cards, as James said, are extremely fast. They're the fastest in the world. But if you don't need to actually have a network card to talk to the host and then back out to the network, but if you can off make some of that decision in the card itself, which you can do on an FPGA based device, then you can achieve much higher speeds. And so, you know, um, all of us, I think, have products which uh, have FDK, um, FDKs that enable you to write your own code in the FPGAs that come in the hardware that we sell. And, you know, you can get ridiculous, uh, uh, ridiculous latencies in terms of tick to trade now. Uh, if you, you know, you, you can't actually make a lot of decisions on the fly, but you can uh, use an interesting combination of processing in the, in the host and on the card to calculate a what if, a whole range of what if trades. You know, what would I do if the next tick in this security was, you know, in this direction? Uh, for this much quantity, you know, what would be my trade? And you can cache a lot of these potential what if trades down in the hardware on your card. Uh, and then you can pattern match, you know, the, the, the market data packet as it comes in. And as soon as you detect what that new quote is, you can quickly look up inside the card the appropriate order packet and have it coming out onto the network before the market data packets even finish coming into the card. Um, and so you can get tick to trades well under 100 nanoseconds then. Um, and uh, so that's, that's when it gets really interesting. Um, and, and that's sort of where we are now. I think people are looking at using more programmable hardware than software, uh, close to the network, uh, you know, trying to make decisions as, as quickly as possible. And that's not just trading decisions, it can be risk decisions if you're a broker or you know potentially exchanges could be doing this sort of thing around the periphery of their environment so there, there, there is this broad trend from software to hardware as well that's happening uh in in perhaps the last 10, 10 years or so i think that's that's one of the challenges as well that's even that's sort of magnifying this thing between those who can and those who just can't you know because F, fpga based work you know I've, I, I work still with FPGA based companies in my kind of consulting world and it's very clear that FPGA programming is complex, takes longer, you need specific people, they're scarce people, um, different bits of the market attract those guys. Therefore, I think in some respects is, is kind of building a bigger gap at the moment of those who can and those who just can't. Um, and as, as Greg has just kind of described, to be really, really efficient at trading now, you need to really understand this stuff and you need the people and the capacity to, to work with it, right? And it's, it's a big gap for those who just can't. And I still come across on a weekly basis organisations who just do not, do not have the wherewithal to even start down this road. And it's, it's very complicated and, you know, it's, Greg and James probably are, know better than me, you know, every couple of years there'd be a new generation of FPGAs come, come out and all the frameworks and tool sets that people have built have got to be refreshed. So unless you can keep abreast of that investment, it's kind of not, not worth a lot once you get out of date, right? <laughs> so it's, it's a real, it, it's, it's becoming very sharp, very focused, very complex, and you're either in that game or you're not increasingly so, right? Yeah, there are certain it's trades. Um, there are certain okay. trades that nobody can spend their way into them. They just have the expertise. They've got it locked up. You know, they've got the, they've got everything tuned up to the last possible latency, and it's very hard to, to compete with that. That's pushing. I think you know one of the things we wanted to talk about was AI and machine learning and so on. Um, I think uh, one of the responses, if you're a, you know. A two-man shop in Sydney or Chicago or wherever and you're trying to compete against this you know you're probably not going to go head to head on you know a latency based trade because you're going to lose so you then start thinking about um, you know obviously if you can forecast with some degree of uh, accuracy it's like being fast you know it's noisy it's like being faster with a bit of noise thrown in if you can forecast a little bit into the future 
and uh, and so this is where the AI ML stuff comes into its own. So people are now starting to, you know, move away from the sort of nanosecond-based trades into maybe microsecond forecasting and having models which are dynamic, um, where you know you can be a bit smarter even if you're not faster. And uh, we used to be very fast and not very smart in our trading, but. You know, there's a sweet spot for everybody uh, in terms of the, how fast they can go versus how smart they might be able to be. And a lot of the big HFTs do have big farms of computers that are doing uh, machine learning stuff as well. You know, that are updating their models of, of the world for not necessarily for their low latency trades, but just for their medium latency trades and adapting themselves intraday to what their opposition are doing. It's very spy versus spy. But uh, you know, as machine learning tools become you know a bit more democratically available, and uh, you know anyone can get an account on Amazon and you can buy a toolkit, and off you go. You know, I think we'll see another wave of you know startups uh, that are a little bit smarter. Um, nobody wants to be slow on purpose, but you know if you can't just get those super fast yeah. trades, um, there's still plenty of room for what's relatively sophisticated slash high frequency trading yeah it's an area I've, I've been sorry I've been, I've been kind of spending quite a bit of time exploring this area myself recently and one of the things that I think is quite interesting that if you, if you look at many organizations have siloed off their kind of technology monitoring performance management capacity management from the business side of things and to Greg's point there the smart organizations are beginning to try and join all of that data together so they can apply, apply those models so that they not only understand how their software is performing how their networks performing but also how their business profile needs to be and joining those things together can give them a very good understanding of their trading and trading performance and at the moment most organizations still treat these things in a very siloed way whereas i think the smarter organizations are beginning to join those data sets up and I think this is an area that we're going to see over the next couple of years that more and more people are going to invest in the joining together of the data sets so they can do this kind of work that Greg's just been outlining. That sounds remarkably easy just bang them together right? Oh uh, yeah you would think so wouldn't you? Well, next week on the Tiger Club we're going to learn to build box girder bridges and rid the world of all known diseases. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you could, you could if one, do, do that in between. <laughs> we um, we did touch on that, uh, and Greg was obviously highlighting some of the, the going very fast. Now we can focus on, on well, we're focused on getting on getting smarter with things like obviously smart network cards and AI is a various tool in there. Um, I'm just obviously aware of our of our time, but I want to look to the future in terms of where we see this as an industry heading. How do technologies such as AI, cloud, how far off are they from becoming a actionable reality when they are making a not an incremental difference but a big a big flip difference and what, what are some of your predictions as to how these are going to have an effect within the high frequency trading industry predictions are always a bit scary you know i thought i'd be flying driving a flying car by now when i was a kid um but look i think it's here i don't think we have to look too far ahead to see ai and ml it's everywhere. It's pervasive in uh, in most industries and in our, you know, behind the technology that we all spend too many hours a day looking at. Um, I, as I mentioned, some of, some of the HFT trading firms have already got a lot of expertise in this field. Um, I think you know conventional funds management even is now looking at uh, you know AI, uh, for, you know, for decision making. So you know the fact that you can have as a service. Uh, uh, hardware and expertise available to you is going to, as I say, open open the world up for some some more startups in this area. And I think we'll see another wave of that. That's that's one forecast I'd make. As as far as other uses of the cloud go, this is a bit of a strange one, but I think someone's going to have a crack at building a stock exchange or some sort of trading venue in the cloud. Um, and uh, you know, there's a you know, it's hard to know how exchanges make their money these days, right? Uh, a lot of it's colo fees, uh, which probably would go out the window if you're in the cloud, but uh, they've got a lot of costs. You know, they spend a lot of time, you know, maintaining a lot of infrastructure that, you know, they could basically walk away from. It, you know, there, there are all sorts of 
whiskers on this idea, you know, exchanges are typically sovereign and, you know, they're very conservative and so on. Um, but, um, and then you've got issues about access. But, um, you know, when we were talking about Judah earlier on, you know, a simple way to, um, rather than building a new exchange for switches, which probably we prefer as in our current jobs that uh, exchanges did, but, you know, an another way to make them fairer is to just timestamp all the orders as they arrive and make sure they get processed in the right, in the correct order. So using that sort of concept together with the cloud, you could suddenly build a fair exchange. You could build a global exchange, you know, if you wanted to take it to the extreme, you know, where, uh, you know, absolute time, wherever you actually entered your order was taken into account as part of the matching process. Look, I, I don't know if that'll happen, but if Jeff Bezos, you know, gets wind of it, you never know. There might be the Amazon uh, uh, equities market sometime in the future. But um, as far as AI and machine learning goes, that's well and truly entrenched. As I said, it's, uh, a lot of it's being used to do uh, forecasts of various time horizons already. As a substitute for being able to go faster, you just try and look a little bit ahead and put up with some noise. Absolutely. Kevin, can I get you to weigh in here on some of these technologies? I love that idea of the other stuff you change in the cloud. Oh, yeah. I want to build it, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think one of the not wishing to sort of put a dampener on the future that the, 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 one of the things that kind of controls the rate of change of all of this is the fact that we work in a very highly regulated market. Somebody said to me a few few months ago, which I thought was a very interesting comment, is you know one of the problems of adopting things like you know cloud as an example in the loosest sense, and I'll drill into that a little bit more in a minute, is the, the vendors of all of these kinds of products are so used to coming from the world of the consumer to this market and the idea is it's a bit like you know us on zoom here the providers of these services want to leave as many controls open to give you as much flexibility and access and sharing as possible from a financial institution point of view you want to switch most of those controls off to start with and then add them back in so that you can comply and live within the regulation all the time and I think one of the biggest challenges we've got in the short term to open up these opportunities is how do people navigate that whole kind of conflict between technology vendors being extremely open to living and building this in a controlled, regulated and compliant way. And I think people are learning an immense amount about this at the moment, but it is a quite a very complicated thing because the people you're dealing with we talk today all about the technology strand right and they are all a certain breed of animal wired in a certain way but their paths are crossing increasingly with compliance officers risk officers people who have got a regulatory mindset which are completely people did wired in different ways and i think the secret is going to be how do you facilitate technology change in a way that's compliant and i think if we can unhook that process to Greg's point, the adoption of things like the cloud will become far more prevalent than they are today. People are in a bit of a muddle over it right now. They're, they're kind of conservative at one level, see the opportunities and are really kind of stuck between the two, the two stalls. But to Greg's point, the other point, you know, AI and machine learning, that particular thing has already left the station, right? People are, people are going there at an alarming rate. Absolutely, James. James, can I get your uh, your your predictions as to where all these cool, all this cool tech is going to have a play? Yeah, we we've got a we've got these bunch of technologies that are around now. But um, as Kevin says, they're with us already. We we've, we've got artificial intelligence. We've got machine learning. We've already got market data from the exchanges in the cloud. So we're already on that journey for an exchange in the cloud. It's there. We've got the concept of FPGA in the cloud. Uh, we've got the network side of it, where we've driven latencies down, uh, you know, they're as low as is sensibly possible. We can always improve on it, but, you know, the gains in that area are going to be less each time because the numbers are now so sharp. But I think the future now is to the smart vendors are going to be looking at how do we bring those technologies together and create platforms create solutions through partnerships to bring these services to reality and to make them accessible to our customers. I think that's, you know, one of Cisco's prime 
roles and contributions to this market with its ability to have a finger in all these technologies and to bring those types of solutions together for our clients. So I think the building blocks are there. We've now got to start to make them cohesive, joined up, brought together. Pretty excellent. Guys, guys, thank you so much for all of your all of your time today. My brain has gone, gone like this from this. Um, that has been absolutely uh, incredible. Um, where is uh, best uh, best to find out more, more about yourself, uh, James? Um, the main Cisco website. That's the best place to come for the ultra low latency product line under the Nexus banner. Go to the Cisco website. Excellent. And, and yourself, Kevin? I guess probably these days it's, you know, you know where we all go to find each other, right? TikTok. <laughs> oh yeah, LinkedIn. Yeah, I'm not that I'm not that young. Yeah. Uh, and yourself, Greg? LinkedIn's probably the only place that's got more than two things about me in one place. Yeah. Pretty awesome. Well thank you, uh, thank you, uh, thank you very much everyone.